All right, today we're looking at the origins of the Cold War, going through a lot of the important events from 1945 to 1960. Keep in mind, these are not all the important events. You do need to read Chapter 29 uh, to get some other stuff that's going on, but these are just some of the big ones that kind of led to uh, that early Cold War. Question one, how did events during and immediately after World War II contribute to the Cold War? All right, so the origins of the Cold War, the things that got it started in the early years, uh, go all the way back to January of 1945. Uh, with the Yalta Conference. This might have been in the chapter on World War II because World War II is definitely going on in January of 1945. And the Yalta Conference was attended by the Big Three. FDR, and there we see him in the picture in the middle, uh, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Britain, of course, and then Joseph Stalin. And at the Yalta Conference, the purpose of the Yalta Conference was to discuss what were the Allies going to do at the end of World War II? What was that post-war world going to look like? And so they came up with several things that they, they wanted to do. Um, first of all, dealing with Germany, uh, Germany had to be made to understand that they lost. That's something they didn't do at the end of World War I. Uh, Germany was not occupied at the end of World War I. This time, Germany would be occupied. It would be divided into uh, actually four zones of occupation. We'll see those in a minute. And so they were going to be made to, un to understand that they had been conquered. Second thing, because of the role the Soviet Union had played in World War II and because of the destruction that the Germans had visited upon the Soviet Union, Stalin wanted reparations. Now, one of the causes of World War II were the heavy reparations that Germany had to pay to the Allies. So, FDR didn't really want to give him reparations, and so they came up with a compromise. The Soviet Union would be able to remove industrial equipment from its part of Germany. Officially, all of the Allies could, but the United States, Britain, and then the other portion was... Uh, going to be occupied by France, uh, they would they weren't going to need the industry. The Soviet Union wanted to industrialize. That's why Stalin wanted reparations. This is a win-win. The Soviet Union gets to take industrial equipment. They get to industrialize. They get their reparations, and it doesn't cripple Germany forever. Also at Yalta, FDR felt that he understood Stalin, and he felt that he understood that Stalin wanted to control Eastern Europe at the end of World War II. Stalin's excuse was basically, look, in the last 30 years, my country has been invaded twice by Germany. I need countries between us that will be on my side and will stop the Germans if they try to invade again. Uh, and so FDR and Stalin kind of had this working relationship. Well... That's the Yalta Conference. That's January of 1945. If you remember April of 1945, FDR's dead. Okay? At the end of the European phase of World War II, uh, the Allies are going to have another conference, the Potsdam Conference. This is in July of 45. So the war is still going on against Japan, uh, but even so, uh, the Allied leaders have changed. Okay? We have uh, for the United States here in the middle, uh, Harry Truman took over after FDR's death in April of 45. The British had gone through an election process at the end of World War II, and they had actually dumped Winston Churchill, uh, the man who led the country to victory. Uh, they voted his party out of office. They felt that he was uh, being too aggressive uh, at the end of the war, and so he was replaced by this guy, Clement Attlee, and that's all we need to know about Clement Attlee. He's not important at the Potsdam Conference, so we're just going to get rid of him right there. The only one from Yalta was Stalin. And so in this conference at the end of the war, um, Truman and Stalin, they don't trust each other. A lot of that had to do with their personal natures. A lot of it also has to do with uh, how Truman was just kind of left out of all the information he needed. He had been vice president since January of 1945 when he and FDR were sworn in uh, to that next term. 
So he didn't know the role that the Soviet Union had played. He felt that it was the United States that beat Germany. To be perfectly honest, it was the, the Soviet Union that beat Germany. 20 million Russians died in World War II. 20 million just Russians died in World War II. And so they really did beat Germany. And so that's why Stalin felt that he was entitled to all these things. Well, uh, Truman also didn't believe that the Soviet Union should be allowed to take Eastern Europe as these uh, buffer states or satellite states like they wanted. And so when Stalin said, look, these are the things I, I want, and I think we already have an agreement on that, Truman said, no, we do not have an agreement on that. Okay. Another cause of the Cold War was the development of the atomic bomb. Okay. It is obviously, it's a devastating weapon. We have it. No one else does. Uh, at the Potsdam Conference, the United States, uh, that, that was when we tested our atomic bomb, and Truman, uh, not getting really anywhere with Stalin, once he found out that the atomic bomb worked, basically went into the negotiations with a new attitude of, look, we are going to get everything we want, and here's why. We have this bomb, and you don't. And so Stalin felt like he was bullied. Uh, but at the same ex same time, he bullied others, so whatever. Yeah. But the development of the atomic bomb was also uh, not just the fact we had it, but also the fact we developed it. Because at the beginning of World War II, the Allies uh, had agreed to share information with each other on scientific developments. And the Manhattan Project, which developed the atomic bomb, the United States and the British agreed to keep all of that information secret. And so we did not tell the Soviet Union we were working on an atomic bomb. Now, just to be fair, they had spies, and so they knew we were working on it. And so when Stalin said, hey, are you working on a bomb? And we said no, he knew we were lying to him, but he's also spying on us, so, you know, again, whatever. All right, other things that led to the Cold War, some of these uh, intrinsic things... Uh, some had to do with our belief system in 1945 and what we believed about communism and the Soviet Union. One of the things we believed was that the Soviet Union's ultimate goal was world domination. We felt that that was what Stalin and communism ultimately wanted, to completely take over the rest of the world. We also believed that all communists anywhere in the world got their marching orders from Moscow. No revolution happened without Moscow directing it. No communist country made a decision without first getting the approval of the Soviet Union leadership. So the idea of communists acting independently of one another uh, just didn't cross our minds. We also believed in this thing called domino theory. Domino theory is going to be one of the easiest things for you to understand all year. Domino theory is very simple. It's like lining dominoes up when you were a kid and knocking one over. When the first one falls, it pushes the second one over, which causes it to fall, which pushes it the third one over, and so on and so on. Domino theory is just that applied to foreign policy. If one country falls to communism, that will spread to its neighbor, it will fall to communism, that will spread to its neighbor, it will fall to communism, and so on, and so on, and so on, until the United States is left alone, surrounded by a world full of communist countries. Now, at the end of World War II, um, the Soviet Union, you know, don't feel like the Cold War was all our fault, it's not. Uh, they have just as much responsibility for it as we do because they do take control of Eastern Europe. One of the agreements in the Atlantic Charter, which Churchill and Roosevelt had worked out and later Stalin had agreed to, was that all people would have self-determination. They would get to choose what government they were going to live under. Well, if you were a country that was liberated by the Soviet Union, uh, you did not get that choice. You instead 
uh, got the Soviet Union telling you what. And so, another thing that the Soviet Union did is they actively uh, supported communist revolutions against uh, the government in Greece. At the end of World War II, you know, most everybody in Europe is, is just kind of done with fighting. Well, a group of communists in Greece decided this was the perfect opportunity to overthrow the monarchy. Greece has a monarchy, but they also have a democratic, uh, democratically elected government. And so these communists decided that this was the perfect opportunity to take over. The communists may be made up 10% of the population. So the Soviet Union just gave them arms and gave them money. At the same time, the Soviet Union also uh, started to threaten the nation of Turkey. Uh, Turkey, of course, uh, borders uh, the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. The Soviet Union wanted the ability to put uh, their navy into the Mediterranean uh, from the Black Sea, and so they, they threatened Turkey. They, they demanded access to the Mediterranean, and if they did not get that access, they threatened to actually invade. So the Soviet Union is is kind of confirming our suspicions in all this, and you know of course if you uh, also take into consideration the fact that they are spying on the United States, you know and in some cases and they're not just active in these places they're active in other places around the world too. Okay. At the end of this this creation of the Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union is going to take over Eastern Europe. Here you have East Germany. Uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, they want Turkey, they want to help Greece, they want to take over Greece, and so uh, they're confirming our suspicions. Question number two, not really a question, but describe containment policy in your own words. I'm going to show you what it is, and then I'll give you some examples, uh, and then I need you to describe it. All right, so our responses to this aggression on the part of the Soviet Union. First of all, was containment. And everything we talk about here is going to fit into the containment picture. Uh, containment, the idea of containment was based on uh, the ideas of this guy named George Kennan. George Kennan was in the U.S. State Department. He was an expert on Russia and the Soviet Union. And he would write this thing uh, that is called the Long Telegram. We call it the Long Telegram because it's about 8,000 words. And it was a telegram, so, you know, of course it's creatively named. But in the Long Telegram, uh, what George Kennan says is the Soviet Union acts tough. But they know they're not. And they will back down if someone stands up to them. Well, they're kind of like that bully in the schoolyard. You know, as long as nobody stands up to them, they are, they're in charge. But once somebody steps stands up to them, they will back down. And so, therefore, he said what we needed to do was we needed to apply counter-pressure. When they put pressure in one area, we needed to just push back. And that is not necessarily always a military response. George Kennan's ideas were that if whatever the Soviet Union did, we just did the opposite. And so if they gave money to a country to try to influence them, to try to get them on their side, our response should be to give that country more money. If they did do something like assassinate the leader of, of a country that was friendly to us, then maybe our response should be assassinate the leader of a country that's friendly to them. But George Kennan's ideas were that that containment could take many different uh, forms and many different uh, shapes. So some of the forms that it took, uh, one of the first ones was this thing called the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine uh, was developed by Harry Truman. He went to Congress and essentially uh, said that it should be the goal of the United States to fight communism anytime, anywhere. His exact words were this, was that the United States would assist any nation resisting subjugation by outside pressures or armed minorities. Okay? So the idea of this small communist revolution in Greece, we would help the 
legitimate government of Greece defeat that, and the idea of this pressure being put on Turkey, we would come to their aid and support them. And so Congress agreed, was, agreed with this and authorized the United States providing arms and money to the government of Greece to fight that revolution and to eventually defeat it. 90% okay? of the people did not want to be communist, and so we provided them the ability to do that. And once we did that, the Soviet Union stopped supporting those communist revolutionaries, especially once they found out, once they figured out that it was going to be uh, fruitless. Truman also ordered the U.S. Navy uh, to boost its presence in the Mediterranean. He sent uh, the battleship Missouri over to uh, Turkey as a show of strength and a show of support for Turkey. And once again, the Soviet Union backed down and stopped threatening Turkey and stopped their support of the communists in Greece. Now another form that containment took was in this thing called the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was the plan for the economic recovery of Europe after World War II. It is named after Truman's Secretary of State, George Marshall. And basically what it was, it was, it was almost like a blank check to the countries of Europe. We gave them billions of dollars in aid. The idea behind it was, if we could build these countries back up, if we could help them uh, stabilize their economies and stabilize their societies, then the communists in those countries wouldn't have the ability to take power. Because one of the thing, one of the ways communists take power in uh, among the people is to look at you and say, "Look, your life will be better under us." Well, if your life is already better, if you if you are already content, then the communist message doesn't carry as much weight with you. Because why would I need to change my government? Why would I need to change my economic system? Why would I need to change my society? I am doing fine. And so we gave billions of dollars to in aid to Europe uh, within 10 years most of Western Europe uh, had recovered from World War II and we're not talking about they, they got to a level that they were at when World War II started uh, we are talking about they had actually exceeded that and if you kind of ignore the economic destruction of that World War II period uh, if you project where they should have been in terms of economic growth uh, they were where they should have been if there had never been a World War II. Okay? By 1955, uh, West Germany, as an example, West Germany was fully recovered and had a thriving economy. Another response of the United States that's going to be military in nature was uh, this report called NSC-68. NSC stands for National Security Council. But NSC-68 was a government report and a plan for America's post-war military. How was the military going to look in order to stop communism? NSC-68 recommended that the government increase spending on defense by 400%. Right? And you're talking about peacetime to peacetime. Peacetime 1933, what are we spending on defense? Uh, peacetime 19... Uh, 50, what are we spending on defense? That, that defense spending in 1950 should be 400% greater than what it typically had been. In addition, for the first time in our history, uh, we need to maintain a large military. And so NSC 68 also uh, recommended that we maintain, and I see that that is misspelled, an army of 1 million people uh, during a time of peace. Question number three, where did the U.S. succeed in stopping communist expansion, and where did the U.S. fail? Okay, so some of the specific uh, incidents in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, that uh, you know not only were symptomatic of the Cold War, but also exacerbated it, made it worse. And, the first one is this thing called the Berlin Blockade. The Berlin Blockade started in June of 1948. And you have to understand uh, what's going on in Germany and in Berlin at this time. 
Okay. Uh, the Soviet Union is going to cut off all access to West Berlin. Okay. This right here, this is the map of the divided Germany. Okay. This is the British zone here in green, uh, the American zone here in yellow, the French zones here in blue, and then the red, Eastern Germany, and this is what the Soviet Union controlled. This little piece right here, this is Berlin, and you can barely make it out. Uh, the yellow part down here, U.S. zone, British zone, French zone. And so this is the city of Berlin. We are responsible for feeding the people in, in this sector. The British are responsible for feeding these people, and so on and so on and so on. Well, in June of 1948, what's happening is people from East Germany are traveling to Berlin crossing into West Berlin and then using that as a means of escape out of Soviet Germany. And this makes communism look bad and this makes the Soviet Union look bad. And so their response uh, was to demand that we surrender West Berlin to their control and give it over to them. Well, Harry Truman would not allow the Soviet Union to take anything else. He felt that we had already given away too much by letting them take over Eastern Europe. So in June of 1948, he started this thing called the Berlin Airlift, where the United States uh, flew from bases in, in our zone. We also flew uh, from the British zone. We flew supplies into West Berlin because even though they cut off ground access to West Berlin, they could not cut off the air. Because if the only way to stop a plane is to shoot it down. And if the Soviet Union shot down a plane, it would be an act of war. And so they were never able to do that. Uh, we brought in supplies, and because of the success of this airlift, uh, we forced the Soviet Union to back down, and eventually they had to uh, stop their blockade of West Berlin. So we did really well there. On the other side of the world, in Asia, China was going through a communist revolution. And China had been going through a communist revolution since uh, the late 1920s. They put their revolution on hold uh, during World War II because they had a common enemy uh, in the Japanese. But whatever, the communists in China were led by this guy named uh, Mao Zedong, or sometimes you see his name uh, spelled Mao Zedong. Uh, pretty close, either way. Uh, whatever, he's leading the communists. The nationalists are being led by a guy named Chiang Kai-shek. And more recently we have started to uh, spell his name and pronounce his name as Zhang Zhixi, because as you can see, those two names are really close. Anyway... Mao won. Okay, Mao was more popular. The nationalists were, were corrupt. They were mismanaged. And so Mao won, and China became communist. Now, the nationalists, uh, in the meantime, uh, they fled to Taiwan, and they declared Taiwan to be independent. Once they declared Taiwan to be independent, uh, the U.S. recognized Taiwan as an independent country. China, to this day, refuses to admit that Taiwan is an independent country. Uh, they instead see it as, as a province in revolution. But, because we recognize Taiwan, because we have uh, a military uh, agreement with Taiwan that we will protect them if they are ever invaded, uh, the Chinese uh, threaten them every once in a while but haven't tried to invade. Another problem with the early Cold War was the arms race that developed. Uh, we had the only atomic bomb, and we had dominance in that area until 1949, when the Soviet Union developed their own atomic bomb. And so then the race was on to find something bigger and better. Uh, we came up with bigger atomic bombs, better atomic bombs. In 1952, we developed this thing called the hydrogen bomb. Much, much more powerful. Okay? Uh, the hydrogen bomb, uh, this, this looks like... Uh, some disturbing uh, artist's conception. This is actually a photograph of a hydrogen bomb blast out in the Pacific. Um, 
when they tested the first American uh, hydrogen bomb, they tested it out on an island in the Pacific, and the telegram that went back uh, at, as soon as the test was conducted uh, was the island is no more. We blew an island off the face of the map. And we had dominance for about nine months. And then the Soviet Union developed their own hydrogen bomb. And so so we're developing these things. They're, they're bigger and better and worse and more destructive and more deadly. Question number four. How was the Korean War representative of the Cold War as a whole? So what I'm asking you to do is kind of go through the, the whole Korean War with me and then, then say, then look at how is it emblematic of what all was going on between us and the Soviet Union. And so this other specific incident here, the Korean War. The Korean War lasts from uh, 1950 to 1953. And I shifted everything over so you can kind of see this map here and so I can point some things out to you. And the Korean War began in June of 1950 when North Korea invaded South Korea. Uh, the thing with Korea is it had been divided here at this place called the 38th parallel. Yeah, the 38th line of latitude. The problem was Korea had been occupied by Japan for several decades and at the end of the war who gets to decide what kind of government Korea is going to have? Communist Soviet Union or uh, capitalist United States? And the decision was well we'll just cut it in half Soviet Union will set up a government here, we'll set up a government there, and in a couple of years, we'll have an election. Which side do you want to live on? Which government do you want to live under? And whoever wins takes the whole thing. Well, North Korea realized they would not win an election. And so, backed by the Soviet Union, North Korea invaded South Korea in June of 1950 and pushed all the way through South Korea, all the way to this point right here. Okay. This is a town called Pusan. Pusan uh, was this little bitty town and this is called the Pusan Perimeter. That was the last thing uh, that was South Korea. So very quickly in June 1950 the United Nations uh, which had been established after World War II uh, voted to defend South Korea and said we will send troops to protect them. This is something called limited war. Our goal was very limited. Our goal is to save South Korea. And so, in June of 1950, in late June of 1950, uh, troops under the control of the United Nations, but 90% of them were from the United States, and they're going to be led by uh, U.S. General Douglas MacArthur, uh, if you remember from World War II, uh, went into South Korea and forced the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel. Well, in October of 1950, the United Nations was trying to say, okay, how do we punish countries who violate uh, the rule of law and violate international agreements? In October of 1950, the United Nations said, okay, here is North Korea's punishment. You don't get to exist anymore. And in October of 1950, the United Nations voted to invade North Korea and unify Korea under the government of South Korea. And so in October of 1950, 90% of the forces of being Americans pushed into North Korea, and they got all the way up to around this line, and specifically they got really close to this place called the Yalu River. The Yalu River is the border between China and North Korea, and the Chinese freaked out. And so in November of 1950, as we got closer and closer to China, uh, the Chinese, if you look at it from their point of view, the United Nations is wiping out one communist country. We are next door to them. What if the United Nations decides to just keep going? And so in November of 1950, China invaded to help out North Korea and shoved everybody, didn't actually shoved us down below the 38th parallel. We finally fought our way back up, and by December of 1950, the fighting is right along in here. Okay? And so it would shift a couple of miles this way, a couple of miles that way, uh, 
for the rest of the war. Okay, so the fighting, you know, started out around the 30th parallel, ended up around the 30th parallel. From 1950 to 1953, this is basically where the fighting is. And in 1953, finally, there is an armistice, a ceasefire signed uh, between North Korea and South Korea. So technically, these two countries remain at war today. Okay, so as far as territorial gains, uh, not a lot accomplished. Question number five. How did the government, how did the United States government, respond to the Red Scare? So we're going to shift gears here for a second. Uh, uh, I know you're working on chapter 29. Some of this is found in chapter 30, but it's very, very brief. And I want to make sure you, you get it, okay, what the Red Scare is. Okay. First of all, Red Scare uh, means fear of communism. So we're looking at the Red Scare that, take place, that takes place after World War II. This is the Red Scare that will always just be referred to as the Red Scare. If you remember, after World War I, there was another Red Scare, another fear of communism. That one will always be uh, noted by the time period, the Red Scare immediately after World War I. The Red Scare of 1919, 1920, 1921, something like that. This one is just the Red Scare. Hey, it's the one everybody uh, is familiar with. So if, you're t if it's just talking about the Red Scare, this is it. Okay. This Red Scare uh, is going to have some, some characteristics to it that, that we should all be familiar with. There is within the House of Representatives, there was this body called the House Un-American Activities Committee. And the abbreviation is pronounced HUAC. Okay. This committee was responsible for investigating uh, alleged communists and people who were engaging in, obviously, un-American activities. It existed before World War II. Uh, their main concern were they were looking for fascists, uh, you know, Nazi sympathizers. But at the end of World War II, they go after communists. Uh, and sometimes uh, this was referred to as just as the committee. If you were called to the committee to testify, if there were allegations that you were a communist, your career was over. There is a group, you can look them up, they're called the Hollywood Ten. Uh, these directors and producers who worked in Hollywood, and during World, this is what really stinks, during World War II, they had been asked to make films uh, that were pro-Soviet because for a couple decades, we'd been telling the American people, look, the Soviet Union's bad, Soviet Union's terrible, communism is evil, communism is horrible. Now there are friends in World War II. Could you please make some films to explain to the American people that they're good and it's okay for us to work with them? Okay, fine. And then, at the beginning of the Cold War, they went after these people, and they were blacklisted. They could not find work in Hollywood after this. But anyway, the House Un-American Activities Committee, one of its members that became very famous uh, because of what uh, they're doing uh, is this guy named Richard Nixon. You'll need to know his name for the next couple of chapters. Uh, this is how he made himself a household name. He's a congressman from California, uh, but he is out there hunting communists and trying to stop uh, threats to our way of life. One of the things that Huack uncovered was uh, this conspiracy by this guy named Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss was uh, an employee of the State Department. He actually uh, helped create uh, some of the groundwork for the United Nations, and he was accused of being not only a communist sympathizer, but also a spy for the Soviet Union. Of course, he denied it. His main accuser was this guy named Whitaker Chambers, uh, who was also, uh, in his idea, he was working for the Soviet Union, but he was really working for us. So he was acting as a double agent. And he said that Alger Hiss had passed on information to him that he was supposed to pass on to the Soviet Union. These were referred to as the Pumpkin Papers, uh, because Whitaker Chambers hid them in a hollowed-out pumpkin on a farm somewhere in New York. Um, they were never able to prove Alger Hiss guilty of spying, because the documents that Chambers had, uh, there were 
several, I, think, I want to say about 150 people that had access to these. So, you know, did you really get them, did you not? Uh, but they were able to convict him of perjury because at one point he had been a member of a communist group and he under oath denied that he had been a member and the government was able to prove, well, right here it says you, you signed and said you were. And so he did go to jail. He always um, protested his innocence. Another element of the Red Scare is what the government did uh, to protect us, I guess, from communist uh, subversion. The government put together this thing called the Loyalty Review Program. The Loyalty Review Program is run by the FBI, and what they did is they went through and they screened all federal employees. They look up your background, they, they check references, who are your friends, who do you hang out with, uh, what groups are you a member of. And if they suspected you were a spy, or if they believed you had the potential to become a spy, you would be fired. And it's, it's that, that last thing that, re that really gets me, the idea of being a, you might at some point in the future possibly become maybe a spy. Because some of the people they went after uh, were, were loyal Americans, okay, a potential spy was a single woman working in the government. If you're a single woman and you have access to classified information, you might become a spy. And that sounds pretty ridiculous, but have you ever seen a James Bond movie? Have you ever seen the women that start out on the other side and all of a sudden James Bond comes in and next thing you know, they're working with him? That was the mentality. Okay? If they found out you were a homosexual, if the FBI can find out, the Soviet Union can find out. And the Soviet Union would use that information to blackmail you and force you to spy for them. And so before they can do that, we're going to go ahead and fire you. Just because something in your background, the FBI thought, made you subject to becoming a spy. Congress also passed this thing called the McCarran Act. The McCarran Act... Um, required communists and all communist groups uh, to register with the federal government. You as a group, if you were going to be a communist group, that was fine, but you had to register with the federal government. And then anytime somebody joined your group, they had to sign and say they were a member, and then that was reported to the government. And so you might hear every once in a while about people being referred to as card-carrying communists. Because the government would take your information and then they would send you a little card that, yes, you were a communist and you needed to keep that on you at all times. That way, if anyone ever stopped you, they could, you know, ask you more questions. Another element of the Red Scare uh, was what happens to this couple named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. That's a funny sounding name, Rosenberg. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg uh, were accused of passing the secrets to the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. How else would these backwards, third world Russians figure out the secrets to the atomic bomb? Okay. Uh, Ethel's brother actually worked on the Manhattan Project. So he had access to stuff. He would actually testify against them, saying he did give them information. In 1951, they were convicted. They were convicted uh, partly because of the testimony of S Ethel's brother, okay, who traded his testimony in exchange for freedom, not being prosecuted. The prosecutors went to the jury and, and essentially said, look, we, we know that w the evidence we have is circumstantial and we know we can't tell you everything, but we're from the government. You can trust us. And these people are communists and you know what they're capable of. And they were convicted and despite their appeals and despite uh, the ideas that the evidence was shaky, uh, they were executed in 1953. And there's always been kind of this uh, f idea that they were wrongfully prosecuted. I mean, look, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg sounds like a weird name, almost like Sacco and Vanzetti, the two Italian guys, if you remember from the 1920s. 
who were convicted and executed because they were immigrants? Well, these two are convicted and executed because they're communists? Well, at the end of the Cold War, once the Cold War was over, uh, the government announced that it had been running this thing called Project Venona. Project Venona uh, was where the FBI had tapped international phone calls that were being made by Americans uh, to suspect places, especially communist countries. And the FBI released that they had all the transcripts of Julius's phone calls to the Soviet Union where he was indeed passing the secrets to the atomic bomb over to the Soviet Union. And so it did prove uh, that they were indeed guilty. Question number six. What was Joseph McCarthy's appeal to ordinary Americans? Why did we like this guy? Okay, so obviously anytime people are afraid, they're going to overreact. One of the people who overreacts is this guy, Joseph McCarthy. Joseph McCarthy was a senator. He was from Wisconsin. And Joseph McCarthy is going to engage in something that we now refer to as McCarthyism. McCarthyism is where you accuse people of doing something with little or no proof whatsoever. In some cases, the proof is actually made up. Joseph McCarthy uh, was a fearmonger, and Joseph McCarthy uh, began to accuse uh, different agencies within the government of having communist spies and communist sympathies. One of the departments he accused was the State Department. He was giving a speech in West Virginia to something like a ladies' garden club, and he said, I have a list of 150 people in the State Department who are known communists and spies for the Soviet Union. He then flew to Washington, and some reporters asked him about it. Well, where's the list? And McCarthy said, well, I don't have it with me. I had it locked up because I know, but they don't know that I know. Um, and, of course, in reality, there's no list, right? Whatever, he made that up, but he got attention for it. And so he would hold these, these hearings. He's, he's on the Senate version of HUAC. Remember, HUAC is the House on American Activities Committee. The Senate had its own version, and he was on it. And so he would hold these hearings, and he would, if he accused you of being a communist sympathizer or a communist spy, um, he would run circles around you, trying to get you to slip up and say something that you didn't mean or take your words out of context and, and try to mentally break you. In 1954, uh, he would accuse the army of being disloyal and having communist sympathies. And so in 1954, uh, we have television now. And so these things were put on TV called the Army McCarthy hearings. McCarthy thought this was going to be a great plan uh, because what he was going to do is he was going to, on television, in front of the American public, show us that he was out there hunting communists. And 1956 is a presidential election year. This may boost his political popularity enough that he could run for president. Fortunately for us, unfortunately for him, we did see what he was doing on television. And we did see that he was going after these people with no proof. And we saw uh, that he was, for lack of better words, bullying people. And so rather than boost his popularity and actually cause the American public to, to the support for him to just drop like a rock... Uh, there was rapid loss of support for McCarthy. Within within one year, the Senate was going to uh, censure him. Censure is where the Senate tells you, you have done bad and we know it, shame on you. Um, they don't kick him out or anything. But it does publicly humiliate and disgrace him. Some final overreactions uh, were what happened within American society. Okay. Nationwide, we would conduct air raid drills. You had air raid drills uh, in your town. You had them uh, in your school. Uh, those were fun. Uh, they were called duck and cover drills. Okay. Um, duck and cover, You, the idea was, okay, There's, there's. if there's a nuclear attack, what do you do? Quick, you, you duck and cover, kind of like we do for the, the tornado drills. Um, you know, if, if a tornado comes by the school... You duck and cover because we're trying to protect you from, you know, flying glass and debris in, in a nuclear attack. Same kind of thing, only, you know, the building's going to be, you know, falling down around you. So duck and cover, you'll be okay. 
But these are real. They really did these things. Right? Ask me about them in class uh, next time you see me, and, and I'll tell you uh, my dad's duck and cover story. Right? They would also do civil defense drills, uh, how to respond in, in an emergency. Uh, one of the civil defense drills was uh, they, the air raid sirens would go off, and you would have to run out, and a plane would fly over, and you had a booklet uh, that had the silhouettes of different planes. You know, what would it look like up against the sky? And you would identify the plane from the silhouette, was it ours or theirs, and then you would get on the phone and you would call into Civil Defense Headquarters uh, where the plane was, what direction it was flying, to test your readiness. There was also the building of bomb shelters uh, throughout the country. Okay. And this is just really, really weird. Um, you could buy some of these, like, pre-made... Uh, bomb shelters. They would they would dig a hole and they would drop this thing in there, and it came with. Uh, well, you can see here, it came came with some cots uh, that you could sleep on. It came with uh, canned food and canned water, uh, and oh, how nice, you know, it's how, how comfortable for a little family of three uh, to sit in here. Okay. These these bomb shelters, you know, that one's pre-made, but you could make your own. Uh, there were plenty of magazine articles that told you how to build your own bomb shelter. In fact, between 1945 and 1980, uh, the estimates are that there were somewhere between 1,500 and 3 million private bomb shelters built in the United States. That is a huge statistical anomaly. Okay? Think about it. You know, you know, how many people do this? Well, it's somewhere between you know this percent and that percent, and you know, there's always a you know, very small margin of error. That's a huge margin of error. This is a huge difference. 1,500, it was either 1,500 or 3 million. And the reason that dis, that's such a huge discrepancy is because we don't know how many were actually built. Because if you built one, you kept it a secret. Because the fear was so real, the fear was so prevalent of a Soviet nuclear attack you didn't want anyone else knowing you had a bomb shelter because if they knew you had one, they might run to yours and you wouldn't have enough food, water, whatever to protect your family and them. So you kept it secret from your neighbors. There's a great episode of The Twilight Zone that deals with that. Alright, well that's all for the origins of the Cold War. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. Hopefully you have time to do that on your own. I will see you in class as soon as I can. I promise.